Welcome to Mountain Strong. Today we've come to Lake Eklutna. Lake Eklutna is about an hour north of the city of Anchorage, and as we mentioned in our last video, it is the water supply for the city of Anchorage. A large body of water which can not only meet the needs of the city of Anchorage, but if it were necessary, could meet the needs for the entire state of Alaska. And so it's a, a large body of water, but in coming to this body of water, I've actually made three mistakes. One, I didn't bring my paper copy of the Bible, so you're gonna see me referencing from my phone today. Thankful for technology that the Bible can always be with us even when we happen to forget our physical copy of the Bible. Two, I didn't bring any water with me, and so it's very ironic, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. I'm not one of those raw water people, and uh, I know that uh, in driving up here, I pass a lot of treatment facilities that make all of this beautiful water uh, nice and safe for us to drink. You're welcome to come out here and plunk your head in and have a drink if you would like to, but I'm not going to. Uh, but number three, the third mistake that I made was actually, I didn't give myself enough time in coming here. I had a very busy day, a busy week, and uh, just was able to come up here kind of towards the end of the day. I'm about to have to uh, head out to uh, go to a brotherhood event, uh, an event at our congregation tonight. Uh, but uh, I am thankful to have come here and to see the beauty of God's creation. And it's very appropriate that I've been uh, tasked, or rather I've tasked myself today with two praise psalms. And so the first psalm that we had to look at, praise God for his creation. But let's see what this psalm has to teach us about praising God. Let's read Psalm 105 together. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Jacob, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. When they were few in number, of little account, and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another, he allowed no one to oppress them, he rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. When he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron, until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him, the ruler of the people set him free, and made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions, to bind his princes at his pleasure, and to teach his elders wisdom. Then Israel came to Egypt, Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham, and the Lord made his people very fruitful, and made them stronger than their foes. He turned their hearts to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them, and miracles in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark. They did not rebel against his words. He turned their waters into blood and caused their fish to die. Their land swarmed with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He gave them hail for rain and fiery lightning boats through their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees and shattered the trees of their country. He spoke, and the locusts came, young locusts without number, which devoured all the vegetation in their land and ate up the fruit of their ground. He struck down all the firstborn in their land the first fruits of all their strength. Then he brought out Israel with silver and gold, and there was none among his tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. He spread a cloud for a covering, and fire to give light by night. They asked, and he brought quail, and gave them bread from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river, for he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. So he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing, and he gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the fruit of the people's toil, that they might keep his statues and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. 
I don't know how many preachers or teachers are watching this video, but occasionally as a preacher or teacher, you will do an overview of a Bible subject rather than going verse by verse or even chapter by chapter. You'll go event by event and you'll simply look and touch the highlights of especially the books of history. Well, I've done that before and I've been accused uh, rather negatively of skipping verses. And sometimes people get upset at that and they say, well, why would you do that? Well, here we have an example, an inspired example of skipping verses, an inspired example of looking at history selectively. And as history is looked at selectively, it's interesting what is highlighted. You see, the psalm opens up in the first six verses with an encouragement to sing praises to God. Now, why are we going to praise God? We are going to praise God because He has always provided for His people. He has always cared for His people. He has always blessed His people. And so the events of history that are chosen all the way from the beginning of the patriarch's wanderings with Abraham all the way through the wanderings of the wilderness to the land of Canaan, he describes how God blessed and how God helped and how God showed them the way through and the way forward. Now, if you were to look at those accounts of history differently, in the lives of the patriarchs and especially amongst the children of Israel, you would see unfaithfulness. I can't help but notice as you're looking later on in the psalm there, in a, you know, verses 39 through 42 especially, you know, how he gives them quail when they ask for it, he opens up the rock when they need some water. Well, what about all of the things that, that, that preceded that and that followed that, you know, the, the rebellion, the testing and all of that, uh, it's just not mentioned. And the reason is because this history lesson is not a history lesson designed to get people to reflect upon where they stand with God and, and to encourage them towards right behavior. This is a history lesson designed to teach them how well their God cares for them and has always cared for them. And so, after encouraging or asking uh, the people to, to praise God in those first few verses, what he does in the verses that follow is he describes, again, various accounts of history and describes how God has kept his covenant in a wondrous way. Notice how in the uh, verses uh, that follow that instruction to praise in verses 1 through 6, in verse 7 all the way through verse 15, notice how uh, God cared for the patriarchs. And it's interesting that in this history lesson, the author highlights the fact that God cared for his people, but not uh, to, the, to the point where they didn't face any kind of problem or any kind of danger. There is this fact that they're wandering around in a land that is not theirs, and there are people who potentially could oppress them, but it says in verses 14 and 15 that God gave a decree, don't touch my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. And so God prevented the people from actually harming those patriarchs. But he didn't prevent the patriarchs from suffering, and so there was a famine that came into that land that they were going through. But God prepared for that famine. How did he prepare for it? He prepared for it by putting a man in chains and a, and a chain around his neck. That man was Joseph. And so in verses 16 through 22, notice how he describes Joseph going into slavery as a part of God's preparing for his people and keeping his promises. So again, God is a God of blessing, but that doesn't mean that there won't be times where in verse 19, the word of the Lord is going to test us, where God promises blessings, but our immediate context doesn't show that. Patriarchs were back in the land of Israel suffering famine. Joseph was down in the land of Egypt suffering slavery. But God was using all of that to work out his plan and in his time. In verses 23 all the way through verse 38, he describes that time in Egypt. And you see how in Egypt, in verse 25, God turned the hearts of those people to hate his people because he blessed them so abundantly. He made it to where those people were presented with the opportunity to be jealous. That's the way that God made that. Now, of course, you remember in a James chapter 1, God cannot be tempted with evil and neither does he tempt anyone. God did not force these people to, to hate his people, but he gave them the opportunity to hate these people. And of course, Satan then stepped in and used that opportunity, took that advantage and allowed their lust to conceive and bring forth sin. And sin, of course, through these plagues and through other means to bring forth death. Uh, but again, God in all of this was caring for his people. And the psalmist is highlighting blessings. So not blessings that, uh, that are, are total and uh, categorical, but blessings that stand out in the context of suffering and difficulty. God led them then, as he goes on to describe in verses 39 through 42, through the wilderness, he brings them out with joy, and then they go and they take this land. Uh, they get all this stuff that they, they didn't work for, houses that they didn't uh, build, and vineyards that they didn't plant. At the conclusion of all of that, there's this very, very important reminder from history that these things happened so that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. And as you're reflecting upon that powerful, that powerful point, that history lesson stands. 
God has certainly blessed His people. He has certainly kept His covenant. He has certainly provided, not to the extent that people don't suffer, but to the extent that they can see their way through suffering and see to the other side. But all these things didn't happen merely so God could be faithful to His covenant. He wants us to be faithful to that covenant too. He wants us to keep His statutes and observe His laws. And so as you reflect upon this history lesson, this account of selective history, all those failures and shortcomings of man are kind of set aside for a moment to reflect upon the God who blesses in the face of difficulty and the God who keeps covenant even when there are opportunities for that covenant to fail. God is faithful, and so we should be faithful to the covenant He has given to us to keep His laws and to keep His statutes. May God bless you today.